we have two turbulence models in RAS, the default is none. And this is another case where you might not even know that because you might just not care as a hydraulic modeler. But as a sediment modeler, we care. Um, so this is another case where you have to go and choose a turbulence model. And um, this is all work that Alex did. Um, we'll tell you why in a minute. But there are two turbulence models. <laughs> There's conservative and non-conservative. We started out with the non-conservative method. But here's what happens with the non-conservative method. Um, so here's the channel. This is a, a numerical experiment that, that Alex did. We have this circular channel. It's a half pipe, all right? And we want to compute the velocity across this half pipe. If there's no viscosity, if it's just an inviscid fluid, so that, that means that there's no, um, there's no losses between um, kind of flow paths then this is what the velocity distribution would look like. It's a, the theoretical velocity distribution for an inviscid fluid in a half pipe. But we have viscosity, right? Water is a viscous fluid, which means that these low velocities are going to in, exert a force or, or a shear on the faster velocities um, inside. And so we have to mitigate for that. Um, these should be faster and these should be slower. What the old turbulence model did is it just reduced everything, which means that what does that do to your average velocity? It just, it just dissipates your average velocity, which means what are you gonna do to your end values to compensate? You're just gonna drop your end values to compensate. And so what the new model does is it's it's a little, it's, more, it's more, more robust. It says, no, actually, I'm going to increase these, um, these slower velocities out here, and I'm gonna decrease the, the central velocities, but I'm gonna keep the average velocity similar. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a more robust, real, and this is, if you, if you go and look at a velocity distribution in a half pipe, I, 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 we just published a paper on this, um, this is actually more what it looks like. So that's why we've added this conservative method. N now, um, we're gonna start throwing the backward sixes at you. Um, those of you who've heard me talk before, this is the gang symbol of engineering, right? Um, Chester Watson said there's no easier way to lose a crowd than to throw up the backward si sixes, but it's a continuum. There's gonna be differentials. Um, and so these are governing equations. Um, I've one-dimensionalized them. I think one-dimensional equations are easier to metabolize because then you just add another dimension. But this is our term here. This is the turbulence term. Advection's over here. Temporality's over here. Here's turbulence and mixing. Those of you who are familiar with governing equations, what does that term look like? It's the second derivative. Acceleration. The first derivative is advection. The second derivative is? If the first derivative is a slope, what is the second derivative? It's a curvature. Which means that it's the, a diffusion term, right? The diffusion term in the sediment transport looks like this. It's some diffusion coefficient times the curvature or times the second derivative. This isn't, this isn't magical. All we're doing is we're conceptualizing turbulence as a diffusion process. But this assumes that the velocities vary smoothly. Um, and. Uh, so we can pull the eddy viscosity, which is this, outside of the derivative. The magic that Alex did with the conservative method, and other people have done this before, he embedded the eddy viscosity in the derivative and multiplied by h over h to make it conservative. This was a flume experiment where they had good velo longitudinal velocity distributions. And so you can see that what we've got are the observed velocity distributions at various locations with the non-conservative and the conservative. And the conservative is capturing um, the, uh, the, velocity, the lateral velocity distribution really much better. So what I was getting at with the curvature is, what is the velocity curvature on average there? It's negative everywhere, right? And, and most of like natural channels, on average, spatially, it's going to be negative. So if you're taking something negative and multiplying it by eddy viscosity, the term on average is going to be negative and it acts as a dissipation term, which is not good, right? Because then it's acting like friction. Whereas in the other formulation, that the, that's a diffusive flux 
and the way it's computed is, is like, let's say out of phase, you remove some momentum from one cell and you add that momentum to the next cell and it's exact, right? It's, it's finite volume. And so we're adding and subtracting momentum instead and, and that's much more conservative. And so that's conservative formulation. The other thing that Alex did in 6.0 is we added a new turbulence approach. This is the classical turbulence approach. This is your eddy viscosity, which is just essentially the coefficient of that diffusive term. Um, and it is some mixing coefficient times the shear velocity times the water depth. Right, so that means that it's isotropic, which just means your longitudinal diffusion and your transverse diffusion are the same. Okay, that's already a problem, right? Um, it's also sensitive to roughness. Where? Well, this term, the shear velocity, right? That's going to be, that's a function of your friction slope, which is backed out of which equation? Manning's equation, right? And so your n value, that might as well be n value in there. It's a function of n value. So as your n value changes, your diffusion changes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, right? If your channel is rougher, your velocity distribution, your vertical velocity distribution is going to be kind of more extreme, and that's going to cause more mixing. So that makes sense. And then it's not sensitive to cell size, which that seems like it makes sense. So this has kind of positives and negatives to it. That's the parabolic method. What Alex added is what we call the parabolic Smagorinsky method. The reason it's parabolic Smagorinsky is that, you see that right there? That's the same. We kept the parabolic method. Some models will just do the Smagorinsky, um, but he added the Smagorinsky to it. But what's the first thing you notice about this? He took the opportunity to make it anisotropic. So now we have a longitudinal and a transverse mixing, um, and they have separate coefficients, and so you can define them separately. The next thing he did is he added the Smagorinsky term, where this is the Smagorinsky coefficient, and this is the cell size. Oh. Well, now it's still sensitive to roughness, but that's not Smagorinsky. That's just the parabolic method. Um, it's anisotropic, which is better. Now it's sensitive to cell size. Does that make sense? If you have a big cell, there's lots of like turbulent things going on in that large cell that you're not accounting for. As your cell size gets smaller in a subgrid model, you've got more cross sections. And those cross sections are accounting for more of the irregularities and more of the, more of the contraction expansion. And so the smaller your cross sections get, the less you need to account for this kind of spatial process of mixing and, and turbulence. And so the smaller your cell sizes get, the less the Smagorinsky component adds. But if you're using in huge cell sizes, we're saying, hey, you know, you're probably overlooking a lot of turbulence, so we're going to ratchet up the Smagorinsky component to compensate for that. And so some people will, some people are kind of against Smagorinsky because it is um, tied to the cell size, but that's a feature, not a bug, particularly with a sub subgrid model. So this is always what you'll use. You have three coefficients. You have longitudinal coefficient, a transverse co coefficient, and a Smagorinsky coefficient. If you don't want to use the Smagorinsky term, if you just want to go back to the old parabolic, you just make your Smagorinsky coefficient zero. There's less numerical diffusion if you have smaller cells. And you're also capturing more of the flow field. So let's say there's these small eddies that your coarse resolution doesn't capture them. That's, that's dispersion, right? Mm -hmm. That you capture with the Smagorinsky model. And the Smagorinsky model, it, it has a strain that S, and that's a function of the velocity gradient. And that's kind of a predictor of the intensity of the dispersion within some grid turbulence and dispersion that's happening that you're not capturing within your flow field. So as, that, as your resolution becomes smaller and smaller, you end up simulating all of those small flow features that you were missing with the coarse grid directly. And so <laughs> this is how Alex explained it to me. And so I'm going to explain it to you this way. <laughs> The parabolic term is the vertical stuff. It's the fact that your n value causes, changes your vertical flow distribution, and the, the like steepness of your vertical flow distribution matters because that causes eddies and actually kind of counterintuitively generates lateral mixing because you've got vertical mixing. 
which induces lateral mixing. So the more roughness you have, the more lateral mixing you have. It's the vertical stuff. Smagorinsky is the horizontal stuff. It's how your flow is, respons is responding to gradients across the horizontal plane, which is why if your horizontal plane is smaller, your Smagorinsky effect is smaller and why that scales to the size of the cell. Vertical stuff and horizontal stuff. And you can get rid of either of them by just making those coefficients zero. That's why we took 17 minutes in this talk to actually try to break this down um, so that you feel a little bit comfortable with those three numbers which show up by default, um, but you kind of, I, I hate using default numbers. I don't know what they are. All right, so uh, here, the, here they are. So you choose your model, and then you have a longitudinal mixing coefficient, a transverse mixing, and a Smagorinsky coefficient. Um, by default, longitudinal is three times transverse. Um, and uh, I would generally think about that in relative terms. Alex has provided some guidance here about what these coefficients should be, the range in which you should consider them in different uh, coefficients. But in general, longitudinal should be two to four times transverse. If you do it isotropically, if you use an isotropic model, either not in RAS, we won't let you do, well, I guess you could set those equal, but you know, if another, you're using another model and it's isotropic, you will overpredict floodplain deposition. You will build a big bar. If you're using the non-conservative form, um, you're gonna need larger values to get comparable results. And then here's the, the main thing is that you don't want to wait till your sediment model to do your turbulence because your hydraulic calibration and what n value is going to give you a good hydraulic calibration is going to is going to depend on this because these are compensating losses and so now you're more of your hydraulic losses you're computing explicitly in the model what's an n value well it's just where we put all the losses we don't understand right like every loss we don't understand or compute explicitly we lump into the n value and so you have to take those losses out of the n value as you compute them explicitly if you wait if you do your hydraulic calibration and then do your, add your sediment and then add your turbulence um, you're going to have to go back and redo your hydraulic calibration so um, do do your hydraulic calibration and then be willing to adjust these um, again sediment is going to tell you your sediment is going to tell you if your transverse coefficients are good or not. If your n value intuition, because that's what we're talking about, right? We have intuition for our systems, is built on 1D mo modeling or um, non turbulent 2D modeling, you're going to have to downgrade your n value intuition. Another thing that's happened similarly is that people will calibrate another 2D model, like uh, SRH or ADH, right. and then apply RAS and try to use the same endings n value, and they'll over predict you know, the water levels. And do people know why? Because of the subgrid, RAS right. has more wetted perimeter. Like if you have a, a channel, right? It's using all of that wetted perimeter for, for the friction. And so it produces more friction than if you just have a flat bottom, which you know you would have with a, another model that doesn't have subgrid. So that's about a 13 minute introduction to turbulence modeling in RAS. I'll give you an idea of the sensitivities of the equations and what you want to think about when you select parameters. This was part of a sediment modeling workshop. The entire 2D sediment modeling workshop, we'll put it on the RAS page when we launch that with the release of 6.2. But I wanted to take this excerpt out and kind of include deleted scenes, some of the discussion we didn't include in the full class. But the reason we are launching this on the sediment page is because some of the turbulence modeling is particularly important in sediment transport modeling. For hydraulics, it is really important, but it becomes essential when you do sediment transport modeling, particularly when you're trying to model floodplain deposition. We will include a link to the entire class below when we launch that with 6.2.